Okay, so unit nine, part two, we're gonna get into metal nitrate composite, metal composites. Metal nitrate composites, we call them MM and then C. This S is just showing you composites as you know, plural. So it composes, uh, it consists of a metal base. Again, you. so right now your matrix is gonna be metal, yeah? And then your reinforcement is going to be um, different kinds of uh, chemical compounds. So metal base reinforced with one or more other materials such as your carbon, which is your graphite, and then ceramic or metal. Okay. So you can spike metal into metal base. You can spike carbon into metal base. Your graphite is a form of carbon. And then you can spike ceramic into metal. Yeah. So they were all uh, developed to improve again performance of existing metallic alloys because we're not satisfied with what we have so we want to improve so in industrial world this there is a continuous improvement okay we do this we do that we don't like it sometimes we can find issues because of it so you improve more and more and more and more okay you always think like improving that many years of why you never stop because the issues always come out with different conditions because again the combinations are so infinite that um, you always have issues yeah and this is not a perfect world and it has so uh, doesn't matter what we do there is a floor and every okay um since we always have the floors the improvement is continuous <laughs> Oh my gosh, why do we have the floors even when we use it? Different methods because those who, okay, um, do the job are not the same, okay? Because one person cannot stay alive more than maybe 60 to 100 years, but nobody can work after 60 years your retirement cutoff age, right? They might come back to work, but then you can't expect 100% efficiency out of them. So, uh, how can I say a human life is nothing it's so short and so you study all the way to about maybe 25 30 and you work by 30 to 60 and that's about it and after that it's all downhill you know <laughs> do uh, some simple jobs and stay home and do something else yeah and so anyway uh, what I want to tell you is it's always continuous performance continuous improvement because the group of people who make that product and who make different things, they are different. They vary. Okay, that's why we gotta keep uh, keep up with our standard. And if you go below standard, then you bring it back and try a different methods. Yeah. So many of the matrix compo uh, matrix materials we use alloyed metal instead of pure metals because it's expensive. So common matrices, right, for metal composites, we use aluminum alloy, titanium alloy, copper, and silver. So I want to write this so you don't get a confusion again. So you have a matrix and you have a reinforcement. Okay, though so this is pretty easy to remember. And a composite, okay, a composite is that. You have a matrix and you have a reinforcement matrix okay can be these yeah these are all metals metals and metals alloy reinforcement okay are these okay metal graphite ceramic okay so don't want to um, confused yeah try to write diagram try to write abbreviations like that when you study something because trying to read this it just stay in your head like one or two minutes and you forget all about it but if you write it like that you will never forget composer is a matrix and the reinforcement yeah you might forget this but you will never forget that yeah who needs to remember all of that you don't need to when you go to work you're going to get a chart yeah and just follow the uh, compositions of your chart that's it but at least in your head that gotta stay yeah forever okay i'm gonna go and erase this for you aluminum 
so very good. If you think about aluminum, oh, you remember it's your kitchen aluminum foil. <laughs> it doesn't look like that, yeah. So it's a very good conductor for electricity and heat, of course. Again, heat is a little particle is moving, moving, and we call it heat at our level. And a structure level, there's a particle moving. Okay, so electricity, always remember current, current, current flow of electrons, yeah? Certain aluminum alloys can be stronger than structural steel. Even though they're aluminum alloy compared to your steel, you might think that steel is stronger, but alloys okay, can be stronger because we make it to help them, yeah? So the aluminum alloy is used as matrix. See, matrix. I'm going to write that back down again. Your composite is a matrix plus reinforcement R. So aluminum alloy we're going to use as a matrix in our composite. Why? Because it is lightweight. So therefore, we're going to use an aerospace. We're going to use an automobile industry. Lightweight and it is stronger than the six steel. We need it to be strong, we need it to be lightweight. So strong doesn't mean it's heavy, yeah? So if you think of a little tiny person, you think like that person is not as strong as a big giant guy, not like that. Sometimes a little tiny person can be stronger than a big giant giant guy, okay? So like that. So aluminum alloy, they're used for structural components because of its strength and then your engine blocks and pistons, okay? So let me erase this for you. Titanium, another metal, alloys, high strength to weight ratio. Reinforcing titanium alloys. Then you're gonna use a boron based, okay, or silicon colored based fibers. They're going to increase the stiffness and reduces the weight. Again, what does it do? Increase the stiffness. Again, lightweight. Titanium, chemical reactive. So therefore, you have to have a certain protection of that fiber because you don't want that fiber to be reacting in your composite. Okay, so therefore, you're going to coat it with some protection. Processing, you mean the processing uh, composite, making composite. I'm going to write this again. A composite is your matrix plus your reinforcement. Titanium alloy going into matrix. Titanium is reactive. Therefore, you will protect it. Okay. When you process it to make composite. All right. I'm going to erase this again. Copper. We use copper, you know, everywhere. So it's widely used with other metal as pure copper than as alloy metal. So with composite with copper, we can use it for application requiring high conductivity and high mechanical strength. So if you think about your electric, uh, Electricity at your home has been transported, right? The electron flow is transported. And everywhere you go, you're going to see the post, you know? The electric um, lines, all that wires is copper, most of them are, you know? Later on, we replace with uh, silicon. So, with copper, it can be used for application requiring high conductivity and high mechanical strength. Copper major composites have been developed right, with refractory metal filaments. Excellent combination of high electric conductivity okay, and a mechanical strength has been achieved with these composites. So in short, for copper, you have to understand high conductivity, high mechanical strength. Okay. And that's the goal that we want with copper. And we use copper as the matrix and the composite to achieve that two properties that we want, yeah? Silver, so silver is very ductile and which can be easily fabricated. 
in various ways. So, however, this is a silver composite deck. So, however, this ductility is a drawback under certain con conditions. So, to overcome that, so silver based composite have been developed with reinforcement, and we're going to use some chemicals cadmium oxide, tungsten, tungsten carbide, nickel, molybdenum, and graphite. Okay, so those are the reinforcement to this matrix. And we'll be making the composites and that composites, okay, are going to, to improve this ductility, you know, because ductility is a drawback. Reinforcement. So your second part of your composite. So reinforcement, they usually add strength to the composite materials. Reinforcement, again, the same thing, a review, continue, we're going to make, uh, we can uh, use the reinforcement, continuous fiber, reinforcement, short fibers, and the reinforcement particulates, okay? Short fibers are your whiskers. We have already learned that in ceramic composites. All right, so getting to continuous fibers. They are the most effective means of strengthening the uh, composite materials. And they can be made. We're going to use these chemicals, boron, silicon carbide, carbon, or aluminum outside. Again, what are we doing? Strength. Okay, we're going to increase the strength. Boron fibers. Boron fibers is the first high strength, high modulus elasticity fibers or reinforcing fibers that we use in the your MMC okay, applications. So in the production of this boron reinforced titanium matrix composite, so we're adding boron reinforcement with the titanium matrix composites. So the boron fiber is exposed to um, severe processing environments. And that severe processing environment can degrade the fiber strength and stiffness. Okay? That's just a micro um, diagram that you can see inside. Surface coating or diffusion barriers is going on be added all right to um, get rid of this issue right degradation issue so again when you think about the boron fibers we want high strength high modulus or elasticity but when we make it right boron fiber can go into degradation in the process of making composite because they can't stand the severe processing environment. So we gotta protect the boron by coating, surface coating. We can also protect the boron from degradation by using diffusion barriers, right? And that is the most important thing that you need to remember when you handle the boron fibers in manufacturing environment. Of course, if you want to go into the material line. All right, so another table showing you the properties of bone fibers with the alloy. Here's the property materials, your strength enzyme, your elasticity modulus, and your density. And we have boron, aluminum, and alloy steel. And you can compare it. See how high that is compared to others. Look at that. And this. Density um, is lightest, yeah, but this is very, very strong, yeah. All right, so let's go to the next. So this metal composite with silicon carbide fiber can be made easily. So silicon carbide can bond to metal and resist degradation at high temperature. Again, this is really important because this guy, all right, this fiber, it can bond to the metal, it can resist degradation, therefore better than boron because you don't need to protect it, right, um, from degradation. So example, titanium composite, 
your fiber is silicon, it's going to extend extended exposure, okay, a diffusion bonding temperature without fiber degradation, okay. So that's the most important uh, property about uh, silicon carbide fiber. Another fiber is carbon. So nearly all commercial carbon fibers are manufactured. So we use a thermal charring or colonizing of organic fibers, followed by your heat treatment. Don't forget all your heat treatment types in previous chapter. So to achieve optimum physical and chemical properties, your type of carbon fiber, graphite fiber, they are the carbon fibers that have been treated in upper heat treating temperature range, and we call that uh, graphite, being treated with elevated temperature, right? So common fibers refer to fibers that have been treated at the lower heat treating temperature range is your carbon. So you have a heat treating temperature. So if that's, okay, bottom or lower, that's carbon fiber. If that is upper, okay, or at the top, that's your graphite fiber, and this is your carbon fiber, okay? And this is your heat treating um, temperature, HTT, HT, okay, T. Okay, I'm gonna erase this. It's just a term that you need to familiarize yourself. When it comes to carbon fibers, we have two things going on right there. Another table showing the various properties of several carbon fiber types. So we have fiber types right there. Every time you get the table, you're going to scan the data, okay? You have to um, spot the maximum, right? And the minimum right away, okay? And realize what they are, yeah? Then efficacy. Here, this is the highest and here is the lowest. And when you look at it, see ultra high modulus, low modulus. So look at that, directly proportional to your density. See, so if you have a low density, oh, that's low modulus. So outside at our level, we see the ray, rayon and pitch. Yeah. So high density, ultra high modulus. Outside at our level, so mass of phase pitch. Same thing that you do that on the spot, the max and the minimum, and then connect it to your fiber type and try to understand what's out there. Aluminum oxide fibers look like this weird uh, material right there. It's kind of making you feel, but it's really rough. So, metal composite with aluminum oxide fibers are ideal for applications requiring lightweight at elevated temperatures. So metal composite with aluminum outside fibers are superior to unreinforced metals in stiffness, in strength, in fatigue, performance, and wear characteristics. So when you compare the metal composite with aluminum outside fibers, um, so what it meant is uh, the metal composite made okay, with this reinforcement, and we're using the aluminum outside fibers. They are they're better, right? Uh, better in stiffness, strength, fatigue performance, and wear characteristic um, than the unreinforced uh, regular or conventional metals. Okay, so therefore, you might favor um, the metal composite in some uh, important uh, applications. Tungsten fibers. So the next reinforcement. They're these reinforcements, they're appropriate for turbine plates, pressure vessels, flywheels, and simple loaded beams. So tungsten fibers are also used in fiber reinforced super alloy, so your FRS. It's just a class of engineering material in which the oxidation resistant alloy metric is reinforced with strong, stiff, or right, creep resistant fibers. So these composites are used for high temperature applications. This is just your internal structure diagram showing the tungsten fibers. Discontinuous fibers, so they vary in length depending on the fiber manufacturing process. 
in general, short fibers are easily incorporated into the matrix because they're short. Long fiber is difficult because they're long. So you can imagine like thread for long fibers, how difficult it is to arrange right thread in a uh, perfectly linear and aligned uh, orientation. The short fibers, you have to worry anything about it. We have to just throw them in and mix it. Yeah, they're going to stay anyway. Or we have to just make the mixture to be evenly distributed. So it's really easy to handle. So easy to incorporate okay, into the matrix. Composites with your carbon fiber, silicon, color whisker, and then your refractory metal filaments. So when you look at, look at these uh, different uh, continuous fibers, uh, why do we use different? Because we want different properties. So low density have low thermal expansion. So application that requires these properties, we're going to use this fiber. So use with aluminum magnesium matrix composites application that require you to use these. We're going to use with silicon carbon whiskers, right? Put discontinuous fiber in the metal composite. Refractory metal filaments. High electrical thermal conductor with high strength who favor these physical properties in the composite, you will be choosing this continuous fiber refractory metal filaments okay, to mix with your matrix. All right. Particulates. So, another thing we can mix into the matrix. So, they're used in metal composites to improve again strength of that composite. So, most composites are with particulate. Two we have here in silicon carbide and aluminum oxide. So silicon carbide, so um, this fiber we or particulates we use a composite is used for the gravity and the dye casting. Aluminum oxide particulates we use for the composites, okay, for the wrought uh, materials. So another application of composites with a particulate is to serve as solid lubricant and use as bearings for your, again, aerospace and automobile. So the bearings in aerospace and automobiles uh, requires uh, lubricant, okay? And this is what um, is saying because we use uh, these particulates um, for, for, for this application, particularly for this application. Why? Because they can be, okay, they can, they can be lubricants, right? So that's a pretty important uh, property right there. Okay? You can use it as a solid lubricant. Okay? Lubricants are not always fluid. They can be solid too, okay? Um, and you can put that into the bearings for your aerospace and automobiles, and that's pretty good, yeah? So I'm going to erase this for you. Let's go to manufacturing. Where's my laser? We're going to manufacture metal composites. Traditionally, um, we use a metal and a alloy fabrication process. You already know these processes are costing your powder, metallurgical process, and deformation. Then, so complex shapes with selective reinforcement can be fabricated by using this too. Again, that's a regular, and then this is uh, for complex shapes, okay? So for complex shape, we'll use a super plastic forming and hot isostatic pressing, IHIB. This one is a, a super plastic forming, okay? Diffusion bonding uses material that can be elongated or deformed almost indefinitely under, uh, under suitable conditions without local fracturing. So that's why we want to use this process. So why? We don't want to get local fracturing. And we want to stretch the material. Okay, elongated mean that can be elongated mean you can do the diffusion bonding um, better with those kinds of materials, okay? materials that can be elongated or deformed. So outside, uh, commonly we just say uh, it's stretchable, so therefore diffusion bonding is good, yeah? 
Okay, so hot isostatic pressing is going to form the parts under pressure, press mean pressure, from all directions and at hot mean high temperature yeah, in pressure vessels. Pressure vessels are just a, a machine or instrument because you're using a very high temperature with some pressure yeah, in all directions. So we call that kind of press, hot, isostatic pressing. Just for shaving complex brand on shaves new products. So let me erase this. For regular shape, just do casting. Okay, and a regular methodological process and deformation. Casting and infiltration process. Casting, uh, when you think about it, you always melt, okay? The matrix. So melting of your metal matrix is involved. So you're melting cartoon right there. So there are three common types of this process. One is your slurry casting. So liquid metal is simply ceramics with a solid ceramic particles and then slurry solidifies on cooling. Squeeze casting, okay, pressure is applied to a matrix and that is solid defined. Squeezing means you're just uh, applying a pressure. Infiltration, okay, process of immersing the fibers in a molten metal bar to produce a composite. Yeah, infiltration, maybe you can get this too pretty easily. When you get to the infiltration, your brain is kind of feel a little bit better about it because is actually talking about the process of immersing the fiber in a molten metal bath. Okay, it looks like this kind of molten thing, and you are going to spike the fibers into it. Okay, so trying to imagine these things. That's not infiltration, that's just showing you the, the squeeze casting from the beginning. So, squeeze casting uh, first step, second step, and then the mold come off. Yeah. So the third step. This cartoon is a step for this one here. Yeah? Okay, here is a textbook diagram, a black and white diagram is the same thing. So this is a typical squeeze infiltration apparatus or instrumental machine. The liquid metal is allowed to fall into the dye cavity by withdrawing the sliding base on your crucible, and then the ram is and then are brought down to press the melt into the preform. Yeah, preform is your product. So the typical chemical vapor deposition CVD infiltration unit looks like that. The graphite um, filament activated by the deposition okay, of titanium borate film is then wetted by the aluminum and magnesium alloy to produce a composite, which is your graphite reinforced composite wire. So th these are just showing you your CVD furnaces right here. Here is where you melt. So that's your melt furnace. Okay. These are just the wire taking up the spools, right? And just a 2D cross-sectional drawing. Of course, when you go into the real factory, it's a totally different thing because uh, here you don't have smell or heat or temperature or all the environmental factors, right? You can feel that. But when you go to the factory, that's the first thing you have issue. The majority about 60% uh, is going to fall off from the workforce because they can't stand it. And those who stay get a lot of money, but then over time it hurt the health. Yeah, so they retire probably 50, 60 or die before. Okay, powder metallurgy process. Matrix reinforcement, they're not melted, but bonded at high temperature. So the process involves compacting the powder and then sintering the compacted parts. Okay. Just shaping, sintering. So the process is convenient and versatile for making metal matrix composites. So here we're putting the bar of powder okay, uh, into the mixer, then you're going to mix it. And then we're going to send it to the dye compactor. And then we're going to center in the oven here. Yeah? This is from textbook. This is showing you the flow chart, the powder metallurgy process. And they're producing a silicone to carbide. 
So this is your reinforcement, and that's your uh, matrix. Then we're gonna mix, yeah, blend it, and then consolidate. Then we're gonna process using heat treatment yeah, to shape the product. All right, diffusion bonding. And so process of this technique consists of hot pressing and a rate of fibers between metal foils. So and elevated pressure, so really high pressure, and then high temperature. And you're gonna form, okay, deform around the fibers. So we are making the fibers to be prepped for shaping. So the foils are bonded to the fibers and to other foils. So this process produces preforms, and the preforms can then be laid up to form the design structure. So in addition to boron aluminum composites, diffusion bonding is used for silicon carbide, titanium, and graphite aluminum composite as well. Yeah. And here is just a general uh, diffusion bonding setup that you can be able to see how, what it looks like. And here is your furnace. Okay. Um, these are your bonding dye right there, dye cavity right there. And this is your hydraulic loading, That's just a cell. Uh, here is your the uh, water supply, cold one. Okay, to control the temperature. So the next one here is a uh, diagram showing you a typical diffusion bonding from your textbook process, right? Used to form a boron aluminum composite. So step one, you're gonna apply the aluminum foil. Step two, cut to the shape. And step three, lay up desired pipes. And step four is a vacant and encapsulate. So when you see, what are we doing? We're layering, see? Uh -huh, we layer right there. And step five, and heat it. So while we're heating it, always to fabricate, yeah? Then step six, and we're gonna pressurize. So apply the pressure. And then consolidate, yeah? And step seven, cool it down. So here's your product, a very clean part, yeah? Deformation, so composite is Deform to form the desired product shapes and at the same time control the morphology. And controlling the morphology is the most important thing in making the product because if you mess up here, your product is going to shape come out and you have a defect. You know, you have to redo again. You know, redo is really bad in manufacturing, so you might get fired out if you do the wrong thing. You don't want to do that. Yeah, you have to check everything before you run the operation so important if you're not sure of it your entry level or an intern or co-op don't go and do some crap you know uh, just follow your uh, supervisor okay or we'll stay with them and do exactly what that person tells you to do right? even if you know better or you feel like you're smarter just hold your tongue okay just follow instruction follow instruction You'll never go wrong, okay? That's just not being afraid or anything. It's just being very careful to be in a high cost environment, okay? High cost environment comes with really high stress, comes with the power and the money and the position, okay? When you play with these things, you have to be very, very careful. All right, so deformation processes include your extrusion, drawing, rolling, forging, and hot isostatic pressing. So this is a processes in deformation method. So this process can create a material. So what are we looking for? Our desired property, not very porous, probably aligned fibers, and form the desired shape. And that's important. So easy to write, but so difficult to achieve that, okay, in reality. So deformation processes, rolling, first one, forging, second one, extrusion, we already know that. And then drawing, yeah, pull it out. So try to review your um, is from the previous chapters. Here is another diagram for your textbook. So here is extensive coal deformation, deformation of the uh, copper. Okay, uh, two phases that you can see. Solid can yield right like that. Filaments of okay. Uh, neobium uh, align along the deformation direction. So here you can see this, and that's your one of the deformation process. Properties. 
every time we're thinking about property, we're thinking about this, mechanical, physical, and chemical, right? That's all we have. So the properties of metal composite depend on the matrix and the reinforcement because that's two part of the composite. So I'm gonna write that down again. Matrix and then reinforcement. So if you think about the properties of your composite, okay, that's definitely depend on your matrix and definitely depend on your reinforcement. Okay, distribution because reinforcement is a spike. So you have a spike material. So the distribution got to be even. Otherwise, you would get some property good here at one part and qualities is bad on the other part. We don't want that. So this distribution matters in the mix. And so the blend of processes and manufacturing processes for the composites are very important. Yeah, and our reinforcement orientation. So whoever code the machine got to get the numbers right. OK, since you are your industrial technology, you definitely have to code that. OK, control the numbers. OK, so here that's just a picture and showing you what a hot uh, isostatic pressing okay, two dimensional instrument looks like or machine looks like. Mechanical behavior. So metal composite provide one, we're looking for the increased operation temperature, two, strength and stiffness, improvement or enhancement, and the three is your wear resistant enhancement. So mechanical properties are very anisotropic in the same term coming up, yeah? So dealing with orientation. So the fiber reinforced metal matrix composite depend directly on the fiber orientation. Okay, this is that anisotropy. Why? Because the fiber reinforce composite depend directly on the fiber orientation, how the or uh, how the fibers are located, okay, oriented. So um, properties parallel to the longitudinal fiber, longitudinal fiber, okay. Direction are determined by the fiber, and we want this uh, property high strength. Okay, longitudinal fibers again that direction orientation fibers dominate it. That's how we take it. So property is perpendicular, okay, perpendicular to the transverse. So your transverse fiber direction. So this orientation is determined by your matrix. So longitudinal fiber direction determined by the fiber. Your transverse fiber direction determined by the matrix, okay? So again, you're gonna write your matrix. Here is your composite equal to matrix plus your reinforcement. When we call fiber, that is your reinforcement, okay? Longitudinal fiber direction, high strength determined by the fiber, transverse, okay, fiber direction determined by the matrix, low strength, okay, so we just write down L here, and then high here as a subscript, okay, so this is how we try to remember, I should write this one a little like that, very difficult to write up here on this, I don't like this PowerPoint, we need a better application, so that will just give you some crap, okay, like that, yeah, Low strength, high strength, depends on the fiber direction. Orientation is nothing but your location and direction. Where you place and where is it heading to? So here we go. Let me erase all of that. And it's very important in trying to uh, take it in slowly. Yeah, important points. You can get it by one time, just read it, and the next day you forget everything. So just take a little pencil and some paper and then write it down and make some diagram and put it into your head, you know? Because head, the brain doesn't like a lot of words. Like it likes the chunks of words. Okay? Again, I treat your body as a system because it is a system, okay? The term human and things like that, that's what we define. That doesn't exist. What exists is there you have a physical structure with you. Uh, very, very complex and complicated structure. 
giving you a headache, all kinds of uh, flu inside your body. Yeah? So your brain, again, likes the chunks of the words. It doesn't like long okay, sentences. Try it. You'll never remember all long sentences. You're going to remember maybe for a while and forget it in two or three days. So try to start to draw flow charts. Your brain likes flow charts. Uh, packs of data. Okay, that's why we go packs of data. It can go up to three uh, figures, four figures, okay, and then make a space. So chunks of okay, chunks of the uh, sentence. So that's how you input um, into your memory. Yeah. So that way it can come out easy. If you just go and read, nothing is going to stay in your head. So don't put everything. Put only what's what it matters, and what matters depends on the subject and depends on the professor. Okay, it depends on your school standard. And try to know how to study. Okay, you don't need to know everything. It depends on your line. Yeah. So every professor is going to tell you what's important for your line. So if I study the same textbook, but I, if I am a engineering student, you're going to have a different okay, material to remember or to know. Uh, that you always have to attend lecture or for online classes, listen to the lecture video. Okay? We stay away from the WebEx right now because WebEx wasn't effective for the past five years because um, students are just sticking around and just trying to get attendance and not really actually listening to anything. They're just doing something, okay? On the other side, so we don't even bother with the WebEx anymore. Everybody's giving you your lecture video and um, um, lecture video, you can listen to it. And some people don't listen to that's out of the student, okay, uh, line. You have to listen. Um, why do you have to listen? It's because they, the professors always tell you what's important, what you need to do and what you need to know in your line, okay? Every professor have an incredible amount of either talent or they have experience or they have knowledge, okay? Or they have all the mistakes and failures in their line, okay? They can definitely share you all these things with you so you can be, uh, be careful when you start to work in the workforce, okay? All right, so let's go to the next uh, slide of physical properties. Every time we think of the physical property, we think of density, right? Conductivity, electrical, of course. And then uh, when you think about the density, it's proportional to the fraction and density of the reinforcement and matrix. We only have a reinforcement and matrix in composite. So therefore, when you think about the density for the composite, you are understand, you know, if density is proportional to what? So density is proportional to fraction and density of both of them. Yeah. So try to understand that. So if you want to write it down, so your row, okay, is directly proportional to, or it can be inversely proportional to. It doesn't mention. It's only mentioned proportional to. So it depends on, okay, depends on the uh, material. So you will have one of them, either directly proportional to or inversely proportional to, okay? So one is your fraction, your F, and the other one is a density, okay? Another row right there, density of re either reinforcement or matrix, okay? Yeah. So that's how you are um, trying to get it. So you now know. The physical property of your density compared to electrical conductivity. So in electrical conductivity, it is directly proportional to, okay, so your E is directly, it mentioned here, so directly proportional to your thermal conductivity, okay. So here is your thermal conductivity. That's just abbreviation of the true symbol. So here, density, and when you read, read carefully, it doesn't say directly. So you have either directly or indirectly, okay? Fraction and density, okay, of your reinforcement and the matrix. Okay.
This is just showing you a fluid diagram for your particle, your short fibers and your continuous long fibers and your sheet laminates, okay, inside of your MMCs. And the way they orient it is going to give you different physical properties, hitting the uh, structures and also the electrical conductivity. Here is your table showing you the density, okay, this column right here of your reinforcement. And here are this column showing you all your reinforcement for your MMC. So here are density of reinforcement for metal matrix composites or metal composites. So again, every time you get the table, you're going to look at the scan and you'll be trying to find the highest. Okay, so here, there are the tungsten. And then you'll be trying to find the lowest. So here, a little bit difficult to find the lowest, and you can see right here, carbon. Yeah, so carbon reinforcement has the lowest density. Tungsten reinforcement has the highest density. Okay, and then play with that um, information to make it right for your um, product for applications. Okay, chemical properties. We're looking at the corrosion resistance. So resisting the corrosion, um, it's one of the uh, major target that we want to improve and that's we want the metal composite to resist corrosion so when we take a look at the reinforcement most of the reinforcements are they're not uh, reactive meaning like chemically inert okay so corrosion resistance is going to stay the same okay so it doesn't matter what reinforcement you're using it's not going to uh, change the corrosion resistance significantly so metal matrix composers, uh, they do not have a serious um, corrosion problem at all. Again, the major point is the stuff we put in doesn't react. Yeah, chemically inert. All right, and then we're going to get into uh, next uh, applications. So metal composers are developed to meet requirements, and we want all that, yeah? because they're important to applications that we want to use these composites. So they are high strain, high stiffness, high creep resistant at high temperature. So high wear resistance. You don't want everything wearing one out, okay, in a short time. So you want, oh, you want it to stay a long time. So long density here, aerospace of products that need this improvement because they have to go through space, yeah. Um, so you definitely all of that. And then uh, low density, high conductivity and thermal stability. This is just showing you the uh, metal composite, uh, composite and your particle reinforcement. Okay, And that area is the one that you see under the uh, microstructure right there. So what are we using? We're using, you know, diesel engine piston. So that's for, this is really big for the automobile. So that's got to be train, looks like. And then the brake drum, your space shuttle, and then your microelectronics. This is a heat dissipator in your phone, yeah? And then this is a diagram from your textbook and showing you the area reinforced with the fibers. Typical application of aluminum matrix composite. So your metal matrix in this, so the metal that we use for the matrix is aluminum matrix composite. And we're gonna we re this one is reinforced with the uh, short aluminum oxide fibers. And the application that we use is in your diesel engine piston, okay? Make it stronger. So here you can see our matrix, there's your aluminum matrix. Okay, so that's how you try to, and then your uh, reinforcement, so your R. So in this case, we're using short fibers, your whiskers, yeah? And that is your aluminum oxide. So, L203. Because I just write on a general aluminum oxide, it can be a different kind of so aluminum oxide. And we use a short fibers, so you can write it here whiskers for short fibers. 
Okay, and you will form a composite. Yeah, you have a special composite. And the composite we use in this case, we're using the diesel engine. DEP. Okay, so that's basically what we write. You know, it's kind of really difficult to write right there. So anyway, so you can write a little D right here, and then E right here, and then a piston right there. Of course, that's a very end product. We don't do the end product. We usually go with the part number. So basically, you're going to see the part number, and you're going to see the composition right here, how much you put in, okay? And then the fiber type right there. And usually, it comes with that on documentation, okay? Not just your abbreviation trying to put your into your head. Okay. Then let's go back. In some of the computer program, we don't have to all have to do is just uh, change with what you're um, what you're making every day. Yeah. Let's go through your computer. So it's much easier because we try and get rid of all the paper tray. So here is your automotive, your brake drum. It's a high pressure die cast. Okay. This one is a matrix, metal matrix composite containing your jewelry belt and your copper and nickel. And it's designed for again corrosive sensitivation. You don't want it to be corrosive. That's why you can use a car for a long time, like 20 years. And uh, you will see some rust, of course, down there. But just make sure that you paint them right every year. Uh, Ender the under the car. Okay, so people don't care, don't do anything, just go rushed. And then B is a micrograph of the structure. Okay. This one is just another diagram from your uh, textbook and just showing you a part of your space on the shuttle. So this is a boron aluminum. Okay, here it's a boron aluminum stabilizers. So it's just a, a strut and uh, showing you this stabilizer here. And this one is your struts. Okay. You can see that. Just a part, just remember it's just a part of your space shuttle. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and start chapter uh, unit nine, a part two. Then we will get into your plastic polymers in part three.